Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Iron Africa with me, Georgia Calvin Smith. Tonight, Paul B is set up for another seven year term. The longtime Cameroonian leader's victory in this month's election is confirmed by the Constitutional Council. He's been in power for 35 years and his rivals still question the transparency of the polls. Also, Ethiopia signs a peace deal with ethnic Somali separatists. The agreement with the ONLF is the latest reconciliation project of Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. It formally ends more than three decades of insurgency in the East. And communities around Beni in North Kivu tackle the aftermath of more violence from suspected militia. Much of eastern DR Congo continues to be plagued by instability as fighters from a number of rebel groups take advantage of the remoteness of the region. We take a closer look. But first, Sub-Saharan Africa's oldest leader is in for another term. After over three decades in power, Cameroon's Paul Bia has officially won another seven-year mandate by a landslide. His victory in this month's election was announced on Monday by the Constitutional Court. That comes after weeks of tension in which the 85-year-old's rivals accused him of trying to fix the vote. Indira Etting has more. Paul Bia's victory did not come as a surprise to many. Much of the opposition in Cameroon had accused uh, Bia's camp of uh, massive fraud in the wake of the October 7th presidential elections. In a ceremony which lasted a little over four hours uh, this Monday, Cameroon's constitutional council declared Paul Bia winner of the disputed elections with about 71.28% of uh, the uh, votes. He was closely followed by uh, challenger Maurice Camto, who backed 14.23 percent of uh, the votes. Maurice Camto is, however, claiming victory in the uh, presidential elections as he holds on to exit poll uh, results. I feel sad because uh, these results are fake results based on fake documents. They do not reflect what actually came out from the polls. We'll see what to do, but for now, we also rely on Cameroonian citizens, Cameroonian people, to see exactly how to resist. Going by this result, Paul Bia won a nine out of ten regions in Cameroon, including the two English-speaking regions of the country, which have been in the heart of a separatist crisis since October 2016. Meantime, he lost in the littoral region, which has as capital Douala, the economic capital of uh, Cameroon. This result uh, will add seven years to President Bia's 35-year rule in Cameroon, making him uh, garner a total 42 years in power by the end of his mandate in 2025. He has been at the helm of uh, Cameroon since 1982. Indira Etting there for us. Now, a three-decade-long insurgency in Ethiopia has been formally brought to a close. On Monday, the government said it signed a peace deal with the separatist Ogaden National Liberation Front. Since 1984, it's been fighting for the right to self-determination of ethnic Somalis living in eastern Ethiopia. In 2007, its fighters attacked a Chinese-run oil field. 65 Ethiopians and nine Chinese nationals were killed. Ethiopia removed the ONLF from its terror list in July. I'm joined now by Tom Gardner, who has more on the deal struck with the group. Tom, the ONLF had been calling for the option of secession. Where does this deal leave that question? Well, I mean, uh, frankly, that remains to be seen. Uh, one of the stri striking things about this administration, not just that it's making peace deals, you know, left, right and centre with Eritrea and other Ethiopian rebel movements as well. But also the terms of these agreements are, are entirely untransparent. I mean, what we know about this one is simply that it stipulates both sides should end hostilities and the ONLF to pursue, you know, politics through peaceful means. But the big question of a possible referendum on secession in the future is unanswered. Um, in September, however, the ONLF did say quite clearly that they would demand one. Um, the Ethiopian constitution permits one. And the new regional president of uh, Somali region has made it clear that he wants to break with the practice of previous administrations being more conciliatory towards the ONLF and, you know, broadly secessionist uh, movements in the region. So in that context, it would be quite, it would be a mistake to discount the possibility that this crucial uh, question will be revisited at some time in the relatively near future, um, particularly in a, in, a, in a region like Somali region, which is a historically troubled relationship with the rest of Ethiopia, and that's not going to disappear. Uh, just because Abiy has made a deal with the ONLF. 
Tom, so we saw earlier this year a softening of the government's stance um, uh, to the OLF leading to clashes in Addis. Addis. Is there any likelihood that there would be such fallout from this deal with the ONLF? Um, in the short term, I think probably not. I mean, Ethiopia's Somali region at the moment is heavily militarized, uh, securitized, uh, because it's been uh, so unstable in recent months. So security is paramount. And at the end, his, his government are well aware that it's a potential flashpoint. So it, it's unlikely to turn a blind eye to signs of unrest, as it has, as it appears to have done in other parts of the country, including last month um, around Addis Ababa. Um, but, you know, there's a deal with the OLF um, in August sounded pretty much the same, and, and look what happened to that. There's been continued instability involving elements of the OLF. You haven't actually disarmed as they said they were going to, it seems. So, I mean, it, it would be foolish at this moment in Ethiopia to, to, predict, uh, to predict anything. And why are the Somali regions so important to Addis? I mean, historically, it's been, it's been home to some of the worst instability over the past three decades. Um, there was even a war with Somalia neighboring Somalia in the 1970s there. Um, it's always been one of the most problematic parts of the Ethiopian Federation. And last year, one million or so people were displaced uh, in violence, which erupts along the, its internal border with naming Aromia. So from the start, I mean, Abby's known that Somali region could be one of the fundamental fault lines for his, his administration. Uh, and um, from the get-go, it's been, it's, it's been seen as potentially a destabilizing region for, for, his, for his agenda. Thanks very much, Tom Gardner, there for us in Addis Ababa. Now, after two years in political, political exile, Ethiopian Olympic medalist Faisa Lilesa has returned home. He finished second in the marathon in the Rio Games, but remained in the U.S. after using his moment on the podium to make an anti-government protest. The image of Faisa raising his crossed wrists made global headlines. The gesture was a sign of solidarity with Aroma protesters in Ethiopia, who at the time faced a violent crackdown by security forces. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed has brought in a host of reforms since taking office in April. Fiesa was met by government officials at the airport on Sunday. He says he now believes the country is a freer place. I knew this day was coming because I knew the blood of all these people wasn't going to be spilled in vain. I knew the dictator government would eventually fall. I was expecting this day, but I didn't know if it was going to be today or tomorrow. But it was clear in my mind that I would go back to my father's land, alive. Once again, the people of Beni faced the aftermath of bloodshed. Over the weekend, over a dozen people were killed and 15 others, including 10 children, abducted in an attack blamed on the Ugandan ADF militia. The rebels attacked soldiers on Sunday night. Police tear-gassed residents protesting against the seemingly endless cycle of violence. Now, millions of people have been killed and displaced over the last few decades across eastern DRC, where several militia groups continue to operate. After a night of violence, people around Beni faced the aftermath of bloodshed once more. The Congolese military said it fought off the attack in Matete, which was allegedly carried out by the Ugandan Allied Democratic Forces, or ADF. But locals are growing increasingly frustrated with the instability and the army's inability to protect them. We no longer see the work of government. The Congolese soldiers, whose duty it is to protect us, are either incompetent or they're complicit. The ADF is just one of several militia that have terrorized DR Congo's northeast for decades. The government has limited reach over these vast and remote provinces, and years of conflict have cost communities both mentally and physically. Bukavu in South Kivu has seen some of the most intense violence, and many residents there live in constant fear. This 15-year-old girl almost lost her ability to speak after receiving a severe head injury. In our hometown, the war just never ends. It comes almost every three months, but we have no choice. There's no way to live elsewhere, so we have to stay there and face the endless war. The pervasive insecurity has undermined efforts to control a recent Ebola outbreak around Beni and fueled fears of violence ahead of tense elections in December. Meanwhile, confidence in authorities continues to wane across eastern DRC.
That report by Laurent Berchtacker. Well, that's it for Iron Africa for now. Thanks for joining us. Do so again. Take care.